Okay, hello everyone. So before getting started, uh, maybe some of you met me in the party yesterday and there was some confusion about what was the theme or why I was dressed like this, right? So I wanted to clarify that it's a, a cover by Iron Maiden released in the 80s. So this is what the reference was to. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm glad to clarify for those who didn't know. Uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, my name is Noel. I work at Moodle HQ. I joined in 2019. And actually, this is my first time doing a live presentation. So I'm very excited about that. And I work on the, on the Moodle app. Uh, this is the mobile solutions team. And if you want to speak with us, uh, you can come find us in the Moodle stand in the first floor. And if we are not there, you will find someone from HQ and you can ask for us. And you will be able to reach us for any questions. So what we do, we build the Moodle app, in case you don't know what it is. It's a native application for Android and iOS that uh, users can, can use to connect to the Moodle site. And it has some additional features that you wouldn't find in the LMS. For example, it works offline, so you can download uh, courses for offline use. Uh, it also has support for some plugins, so it's not only Moodle core functionality and is open source and free to use. And we have right now like uh, 8 million active users per month, but this is something that changes every month and depending on, the, on how schools are using it and all that. But uh, it's a big user base. Uh, we also, in the apps team, we also uh, have some premium services. In this case, the Pro and Premium plans for the app, they give some additional features, but this is something that the site administrators have to pay. So not, not every student would have to pay this. It's only that the school pays to give these features to students using the app. And we also have a service called Brandel Moodle App that you can do, use to have an app customized with your institution. But if you want to learn any more about this, you can visit these links or contact us. But uh, this is not what I'm here to talk about today. Today I, I'm going to talk about testing, and I'm curious uh, how many people here would you say you test your code or you have tests? Okay, um, maybe half the room, maybe less than half the room. So uh, my idea here, or one of my goals, is to convince the, the ones who didn't raise your hand that you should test and that it's not as difficult as you may think and you can start doing it in an existing project, as you will see how we did it, right? So first, a quick introduction in case anyone is not familiar with testing or what I mean with that. Uh, testing is basically making sure that your code or your application is doing what you want it to do and that it keeps doing it, right? And there is some different types of tests to achieve this. For example, the ones uh, that you should have more of they are called unit tests, and the idea is that they test units in isolation. These units means like a, a class or something in, in code lang language, right? And also, you usually have unit tests to cover edge cases because you will have a lot of edge cases, and these are usually really fast to run, so it's more effective. And the next ones are integration tests. These are two test different units working together. The idea is that you would use this to you cover complex interactions, but they are also quite fast. Maybe not as fast as unit tests, but they are still kind of fast, right? And finally, we have the end-to-end -end tests, which are the ones that you use to test the more, Im more important parts of your application, like uh, the logging page or things that are critical, right? Uh, the drawback of this is that they are slower. That's why we don't have as many. If not, we would do all like this because they are more trustworthy. And the idea is that they work using different systems together, not only small units or not even only your, your own project. Like in our case, for example, when we run this type of tests, we are not only running the Moodle app, we are also running the LMS core, even though it's not what we do, but to make sure that everything is working together properly, right? And finally, ideally, you wouldn't have this, but there is also manual tests. And this is basically uh, people trying that it works. Or you, as a developer, before releasing a new version, you make sure that everything is working properly, right? Uh, these are performed without automation, and usually they are the most expensive. So the idea is to, that you would minimize this, right? 
And in case you need some convincing about why would you test anything, uh, one of them is for peace of mind, because uh, with a well-tested code base, you can sleep at night. You are, uh, you are more confident in that your code is working properly. Also, to avoid regressions. Basically, this means that uh, you can make changes to your app or your product without being afraid of breaking anything that already exists, right? Uh, also, to reduce bugs. And with this, I don't mean that if you do tests, you will have less bugs in your uh, production apps. What I mean is that whenever you find a bug, if you fix the bug and do nothing else, it's possible that this bug appears again. But if you fix the bug and also write a reproducing test, this bug will never appear again. So that is one of the good points of testing. Whenever you find a bug, you can make a reproductive test so that it doesn't come back, right? Uh, also for handshake overhead, this is maybe a bit of a, a weird term, but what it means is that uh, as, as you keep adding features to a product, the features may increase linearly, right? Like you have more features, but they don't grow exponentially. However, the interactions between these features grows exponentially. So every time you add a new feature, you are potentially breaking a lot more things, right? But if you have tests that are covering these interactions, it's easier to, to keep adding features and be, be safer, like this. And finally, to not repeat yourself, because the reality is that you are probably already testing. Like, uh, nobody writes code without executing it and seeing that it does what it should. It's only that we are used to, to test it uh, by ourselves and we don't automate that. But if you learn some of the techniques about testing, uh, in the end it doesn't take longer to test and automate the test. So it's something worth keeping in mind as well, that you are already testing, it's just that probably you are not automating it. And in our case, in the Moodle app, there are some challenges we have compared to testing, for example, the, the LMS core. So, for example, we support all devices, uh, all the way back to Android 5.1 and iOS 11. We also support all versions of the LMS. Also, I have, although I have to caveat this with uh, saying that officially, we only support the supported versions of the LMS. So, right now it's uh, 3.9, right? But the application works with also 3.5 sites and upwards, and we have not removed any code making it compatible. So, in in practice, you will be able to use it even with older sites. But if you find some bug that maybe it's very difficult to fix, maybe we will tell you that uh, we will not fix it because it's not a supported version. But in practice, it works with uh, old sites as well. Uh, we also have offline functionality, as I mentioned before. And this for testing is important because it's not something that we do usually while we are developing the app. We, we, most of the time, we have internet connection. So the offline functionality is not something that you would uh, use normally on your day to day if no, you are not a user. So this is also a challenge of something that you need to test. And also media playback, like videos or audio, audio is something that in mobile devices is, is a bit more complicated than maybe in, in a browser. Yeah. But we also have some advantages. Like, for example, uh, the Moodle app doesn't have all the functionality that the LMS core would have. It's mostly focused for, student, focused for students. We also have some functionality for teachers. But it doesn't include, for example, things for administrator or course creation or course edition. So that simplifies the functionalities. Uh, also, we do global updates. And I wasn't sure if I should add this in advantages or challenges. But in the end, I added it to advantages because we usually don't only have to keep in mind one version of the app. When we release the new version, the previous version of the, of the app is already not uh, recommended. So if anyone has a bug or something, we tell them that they should use the latest version uh, most of the time, right? So to have a sense of the scale of what this means, global updates, uh, normally when a Moodle site is updated or when a new release of the LMS core comes out, uh, each administrator decides when they will get this new version in their site, right? But with the Moodle app, it's not like this. Uh, if some institutions have a VMA or a custom app, then it works like that. But for most sites that they are using the official Moodle HQ app, uh, the application is updated for everybody when the new version comes out. And this is some stats from uh, three years ago, from 2020 
were doing a new Android release, we would impact uh, almost 7 million users on, on the same day, same day, right? So this is why, I'm, why I mean with global updates, yeah. And basically the meat of this presentation is this part. This is a timeline of what has been happening in the Moodle app regarding testing. And the first dot here is when the app was released in 2013. Uh, it was based on the unofficial Moodle mobile. You can, if you are interested, you can follow the issues in, in the tracker to see more of the history. And this is some screenshots of what it looked like. It has changed a lot since then. Uh, the team size was one person, which was Juan Leiva, who is today the head of mobile, and total tests, zero. So uh, in reality, I'm sure he, he tested things to see that everything working properly, but when I say zero, I mean there wasn't anything uh, structured or done in an automated way, right? Uh, then uh, in 2016, uh, with that version 3.1.2, uh, we started doing manual tests in an organized way and in the, the first version we have of this had uh, 156 tests. So that you know what I mean with this. Uh, this is an example of a real spreadsheet we had at the, at the time and we have a list of use cases of things that uh, we have in the app and manually we go through each of them and we test it on Android and on iOS and using different devices and different model sites, right? So as you can imagine, this is very time uh, consuming, but it's something we do to, to make sure that the quality of the app stays, uh, is good and works properly, right? Uh, nowadays, we have improved this a lot. Uh, we have now a, a plugin we have developed for, for our internal use, and it's basically the same as before, but it's a bit more, uh, structure and easier to use. We also have some instructions, some QR codes to do a quick login, etc. But the basic idea in the, end, in the end is the same. We do all of these tests uh, manually every time a new version of the app comes up. And this is an example of uh, the typical testing with different devices, testing it in different operative systems, etc. And then in 2019, we finally started getting something related to automation, and this was actually a community contribution by Sam Marshall from the Open University. And what he did is that he added some big hat test uh, steps uh, into core that worked for testing the Moodle app. Like big hat is a technology that already existed for the LMS, and it's basically a program that executes a browser and does what, does what a, a user would do, like click a link, fill a form, etc. right? And it can do it in an automated way to see that the outcome is the expected. And this is an example of what that looked like at the time, and today is mostly the same. So you just write the steps of what should happen, and this is executed every time to see that everything is happening as you expect it, right? Uh, Later in, in 20, June 2020, we finally added these uh, steps into the app itself. So we used this functionality to test the app, that it worked properly, right? And this is something that has been changing a lot since then. If you are interested in the technical details, you can follow these issues. And you can also read the documentation where you will find how to use this also for your plugins. So if you are developing a plugin that has mobile support, you can also use Behat tests to make sure that it works properly and keep it working, right? Uh, nowadays, we use these Behat tests into our integration pipeline. So whenever we do a new pull request to add any code in the application, uh, we ex execute all the Behat tests to make sure that it doesn't break anything. And also, uh, we have some Jenkins tests, making sure that these Behat tests work with different combinations, like with different versions of the LMS, etc. And as you can see, uh, right now they take 70 minutes to run. So this is why I was saying before that they are slower and you should minimize them whenever possible to, to make your CI pipeline quicker, right? Uh, later on, we, we added uh, unit tests. <coughs> These are uh, using Jest. And in this case, the unit tests of the application maybe are uh, more important than you would imagine for LMS core because the application is uh, completely built using JavaScript and TypeScript. So there is a, a lot more surface area that can be covered with this type of testing, right? Uh, you can also read the documentation in case you are interested in doing any of this yourself. And uh, this is an example of what this look like. As I was mentioning, 
uh, one of the common things to do is to test edge cases. Like in, in here, we are checking a URL of a Moodle site, and we are seeing how it would uh, infer the correct Moodle domain from this URL. This is something that we use in the login of the app, and if we had to do a big hat test to test each of these use cases, you would imagine instead of 70 minutes, it would be three hours or, or even worse, right? So that's the idea of covering edge cases with unit tests as much as possible. And then in 21, we added some performance tests. And this is something we are still working on. But the idea is that uh, whenever you change something in the application, we want to make sure that the performance is not degraded, right? There is one tool called Lighthouse. Maybe you've heard of it. And the stats we are tracking are similar to that. So how much it takes to render for the first time, how much it takes to log in, etc. Although these ones, in the end, we ended up removing them because we had them running for a year, and they, they were more trouble than they were worth. Like, I think in a year, they never helped us detect some regression in the performance, but there was often failures that were due to random circumstances, right? So this is also something to keep in mind when you are testing, is that your tests, in the end, they need to help you. So if you have been adding tests and they are annoying and you, nev and you never find a bug or anything, thanks to them, you should rethink your strategy. Because in the end, tests are to keep you more comfortable with your code, not to give you more headaches, right? Uh, and the, the latest one we added in terms of code is a snapshot tests. This is actually something that came out of the, of the Moodle stand last year. Someone came talking to us, and they gave us some ideas. And we, we have implemented this in the app. And you can also use this if, for, for the LMS, even if you don't use the app at all, right? And the idea, basically, is that we keep, a, we keep a screenshot of the UI of the application, and we detect the changes that happen every time something changes in the code. For example, this one in the left, this happened when we upgraded the font awesome version. You can see how, just visually, you see the changes that happened. This is something that you wouldn't detect just with a VHAT test, because it's very specific, right? And also the one in the right is when we added some, some new profile fields to the user profile, right? And the idea with this is that when something like this changes, you include the change of the screenshot as well in the commit. So this also comes useful when someone is looking at the history of the commits, and they say they see something changing the UI. Maybe they, they don't know what actually changed, just looking at the HTML div, right? But it's very useful that you also have these screenshots in the commit itself to see what actually changed in the UI, right? So basically, that, that's uh, everything we have done so far in the app itself. And the latest thing is that we have integrated all, all this suite of BHAT into the tracker. So something that, is, that usually happens is that uh, changes in core break functionality in the app. The, this ideally shouldn't happen, because one of the testing instructions to make sure that the code that gets into core is working properly is that it doesn't break the app. But the reality is that something, something is very obscure, a use case that if you don't know the app uh, in depth, you, you cannot find, and it ends up breaking anyway. So by doing this, we expect to reduce that, that from happening, and we are still fine tuning it. So maybe if you get one of these errors, you will see someone from the apps team that comes and gives you more details of what is actually happening under the hood. And basically, that, that's what we have done, right? And as I was telling you before, even if you already have uh, code and it's something you have been doing for a long time and you have not automated anything, it's never too late to start. Uh, we, we have been improving it recently, uh, and we still have a lot more to go. But we have seen that doing these things have improved a lot the confidence we have in our code and our process of testing QA and ensuring quality, right? This is what testing looks today. You may notice it's an inverted pyramid, so the opposite of what I said at the beginning that you should do. And, but to be honest, the, this is the reality. Like, ideally, yes, you would have the other pyramid. But in a project like ours that started without tests, if you, if you have to start adding tests, the more important ones are the, the ones at the top, because are the ones that govern the golden path, right? And when you already have everything covered in the golden path, 
little by little, you can start adding things uh, at the bottom, right? But if you can only choose a few, it makes sense to choose the ones that are at the top. So this is why this is the situation today, and it's something we, we hope to keep improving. Uh, we also have the app written in TypeScript, and we have been fixing, we have been improving how we use TypeScript. And other than this, uh, the team size has grown, grown quite a bit. Uh, today we are 15 people. To be fair, some, some of them don't, don't work on, on the code of the app itself. They are more looking, communicated with clients, doing support, etc. But uh, there is more, more people who have eyes on the app today. And also there is even one person, Isa, who is dedicated to QA. And this is also very useful because we developers, we are very used to the quirks of the app, or we may understand why something doesn't work as you would expect. But it's important to have something, someone with an outside view that can help you see the things like the user would, right? And if you can help us, you can join the beta testing program. So you can join in Google Play for Android and test flight for iOS. And you would get the new version of the app a few weeks before it's released. And you can tell us about any issues that you find before, before, before it hits the final user, right? And finally, that's it. Thank you. And if you have any questions, let me know. There's a question there. Hi. Um, you're putting before and after screenshots in the commit. How are you doing that? Are they going in the message somehow, or are you putting them in a resource file it's, and committing them? Yeah, the, the, this uh, plugin, so if you, if you look at the GitHub repository for the plugin, there is documentation, and you can see how it works. But basically, there is a folder in your repository that is called uh, Snapshots, and it's a folder with uh, images. So whenever you run the test, it generates this image, so the first time you run the test in your machine, it will generate this image for you. And then the next time you run the test, it will ch compare with it. And if, it, if it's the same, great, uh, the test will work. In, if it fails, it will give you three images. The one you had before, the new image, and the one comparing the states. That is the one you saw here. So the idea is that you just commit the new one if it's an intended change. If it isn't, then you fix the code and it should be working again. Hi. Um, do you write tests before you write the code or after? Good question. Good question. So, ideally, ideally, uh, I don't believe in TDD 100%. So I don't believe you should always be writing all your tests before. But as I said at the beginning, uh, we already test while we are coding, and the idea is to not repeat yourself, right? So for, for some new features, uh, we actually write the test before, and they're actually even useful for development. For example, if you are testing something in the login workflow and you have to develop it, it's very annoying every time you change one line in the code to log out, log in again, do everything, right? But if you have everything in Hat, it's easier to debug and it's easier to develop. So many times we do this, we write the tests before. But some other times uh, we don't, just because it's quicker to do it without writing the test before. And also, as I've mentioned, uh, we have started, started adding tests recently compared with the lifetime of the application. So there is a lot of code in the app that is not tested. So that, that's my opinion on that. Ideally, yes, but we don't always do it. So it depends on the use case. Yeah. Um, so you said that not everything is um, tested right now. Are you trying to achieve 100% uh, <laughs> test coverage? That, that is another topic. Ideally, yes. In practice, I mean, even if we could do it, uh, I don't know if we would want to dedicate so much time. Like, 
I guess it depends on the project. The Moodle app in particular, the code base is really big. So as you can imagine, I don't think it's feasible to do it. Like, and even if we had it, 100% uh, test coverage is usually done with unit tests most of the time. So you can still have bugs or something, you know, it's not. So uh, no, I don't, I don't think we will reach 100% test coverage. I think the goal would be to invert the pyramid, that for sure. But the 100% test coverage, uh, I don't see it. <laughs> Anybody else you wanted? Yeah. He's coming, he's coming. <laughs> I know, okay, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Do you use uh, fuzzing at all? If we use what? Fuzzing. Uh, what is that? And oh, uh, <laughs> randomly generating user input. It ah, just okay. Nonsense. Yeah. yeah uh, no, at the moment we don't. Uh, maybe it's something we would like to do at some point, but uh, at the moment we don't. No. Yeah, so in, in, if someone is not familiar with what he's asking, basically the idea is that uh, if you are testing, for example, the UI, and you always put uh, the same hard-coded thing, it will always work, right? But it's nice, for example, if you have a form that takes a date to try with random dates, to see that nothing breaks with some date that maybe you didn't intend, right? But this is something we are still not doing. It would be nice at some point, yeah. When you test, you do only in um, English or do you test for yeah. other languages? Uh, because the, the strings the moment, sometimes are longer. Yeah, at the moment we only do it in English, yeah. Okay. At some point it would be nice to do it in different languages, yeah. Yeah, and maybe off topic, um, uh, desktop, desktop version of Moodle Mobile still works? Or uh, we discontinued it yeah. because technically it's, uh, you, would be, you are able to install APKs and uh, iOS applications in, in the desktop now. So we discontinued it because you should be able to do it with the mobile version of the app. But the app is, uh, we do test it and we make sure it works for tablets as well. So it should, it should work in landscape and portrait and, yeah. I will just cut in here that I'm on the LMS team and I've recently, with some of my acceptance tests, started using other languages. Say for instance, you'll see with the filtering of a name the all button sometimes changes languages. So if you say, I select all, it doesn't work if you're using like Japanese because it's not all, it's something else. So yeah, you can still use different languages, but you have to install the lang pack while writing the tests. So. Anyone else have questions? I think we've got time for a couple, maybe a minute or two. Well, if not, then that's it. Oh, okay, there's one there. We have <laughs> sure, sure. one more maybe? Uh, I just wondered, um, towards your deployment strategies, how do you incorporate testing there? Because you mentioned you test along writing the codes, yeah. but... Yeah, yeah. We have it written in GitHub Actions. So actually, if you go at the repository of the Moodle app, you will see there is a, fi a file called ci.yaml or something, and it's, it's there. So you can look at the source code. But basically, it's a GitHub Actions. You can configure the, some scripts to run, and they run BHAT using the CI jobs. Hmm. Anybody else? Ah, okay, thank you very much.